Hello and welcome to this episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast, episode number 163 with Joshua Broji of Wolf University, a really unique network that he's working on uh, that really dismantles some of the borders and kind of gatekeeping that has existed in higher ed for a very long time. So uh, I was really excited to talk with him about uh, his model, uh, the work that he's doing, and uh, specifically about supporting uh, global online learner communities and the best practices that he's found uh, in doing that. So uh, definitely connect with him, check out Wolf. They're doing really cool stuff uh, and really happy that we got to have this conversation. And as we head into this episode, uh, definitely take our listeners survey, check out our merch store, all the usual stuff. Uh, Check out the show notes for ways to connect with uh, Joshua and Wolf. And also, as kind of a brief acknowledgement, uh, if you follow me on social media, you know, uh, this past week has kind of been weird for me. Um, and, uh, you know, just getting laid off from my day job, but still keeping the podcast going, uh, really appreciating my network and community of folks reaching out for support. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for more updates on that front. Uh, but so glad that I can still uh, bring this episode to you all uh, on schedule. Uh, this is episode number 163 with Joshua Broji. I am very excited for our topic and conversation today. Uh, I found out about Wolf uh, as a uh, organization a little while ago, and I was just immediately fascinated. So I'm glad to learn a little bit more myself and share this conversation out with everybody uh, in our audience as well. So uh, we will start out, though, as we always do, uh, getting right into it here, having our guests introduce themselves and give a brief overview of their professional background and how they got to be where they are today. Excellent. Well, Dustin, many thanks for having me here. So, you know, my own background is that I, I'm an American, but I've been living in Germany and the UK for most of the last 10 plus years. I was an academic for a long time on the faculty at the University of Oxford and the governing parliament of that university. I did some kind of administrative work around new programs and uh, rolling those out across the 38 colleges at Oxford and student admissions. But generally, I was, I was a proper academic, so I was a lecturer in philosophy. Um, But about four years ago, I started a new organization called Wolf University, which is the first global collegiate university to allow other education organizations to join as member colleges. And so as a collegiate university, we're like the University of California system, the University of London system, where other organizations can join. And then they fall within our kind of broader university system, but they have a lot of independence at the college level. So that's something that, that I've been really focused on for the last several years. Yeah, that's what really interested me. I think it's such a you know refreshing and new approach to kind of innovate how colleges work, frankly. Or like I think you do see a lot of you know kind of gatekeeping and friction for uh, these sort of new approaches and everything. So you know if you just want to you know before we get into the rest of our conversation, explain a little bit about what Wolf as an organization does in terms of you know like you said like the sort of foundation or sort of structure would be familiar to people, but I guess like sort of day-to-day, like what you do for the various kind of uh, members of uh, the greater Wolf uh, University kind of community and everything. So yeah, just uh, explain a little bit about what Wolf does exactly. Yeah. So our mission is to increase access to world-class higher education and ensure that it's globally recognized and transferable. The transferability bit generally means proper accreditation and uh, having governments, you know, really be able to recognize what we're doing. So like other collegiate universities, we have many colleges, you know, Oxford has many colleges and there are 38 of them. Um, The Delhi University has maybe 98 colleges. The UC system has colleges. And I would tend to position collegiate universities on a spectrum where at one end you have a very kind of top level university centric approach. So Oxford would fall into that category. Nobody says, you know, mom, I got into St. John's College. They'd say, mom, I got into Oxford. Uh, At the other end of the spectrum, you have kind of the college level focus. So at the University of London or in the UC system, you'd never say, I got into the UC system. You'd say, I got into Berkeley or I got into, you know, uh, King's College London. And so Mm -hmm. Wolf tends to fall in the middle there where we really like to put our colleges front and center and support them by allowing them to um, have their own way of doing things within our policies, but really to own the relationship with students. And so we ended up with three levels as an organization. We have all the colleges 
We have software that tracks our activities to make sure it meets the general university standards. And then we have a, a regulatory and licensing practice. And so some college does something in our software and we match it to our regula regulatory licenses. And then it's an accredited uh, program that they're offering. Um, and that's a, a new system. I don't think there's ever been anything out there built quite like that, but it means that colleges can create new programs and have them accredited very, very quickly. Yeah, that 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 is just kind of the the tagline. I think here, the really the headline is just you know a premise or an opportunity to expedite innovation in the higher ed space with new programs or you know new new institutions that maybe are focusing on particular populations or content areas or something, and just having all of that happen way more efficiently. And I think with sort of a a lens towards a kind of global and online approach. So, you know, and that's kind of what we wanted to talk about today is, you know, you do just have this very unique vantage point at kind of the online global learner experience and everything. So, um, you know, we'll start kind of just with sort of the widest view here. Like, what do you see as kind of the current landscape for online learner communities? You know, these students who are in classes together, learning together, like, you know, what are sort of the, uh, you know, the current standards or sort of the current like zeitgeist, I guess, or sort of like, you know, styles for facilitating that. Cause I think it is still something that's fairly, uh, fairly new in yeah. the sense that, you know, institutions may have on uh, online students and international students, but it's like, they're still kind of anchored around their own sort of home countries, sort of, uh, I don't know, way of doing things. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Very open-ended, very broad, but just kind of, yeah. What, what do you see as the current landscape here? Yeah, there are so many um, directions we could take this, but the first thing to note, I think, is that before COVID, the question in my mind would have been, what percentage of brick and mortar university life is online? And we put some number on that, but the number's a lot higher after COVID. So if I'm enrolled at a physical campus, I, I might still submit all my homework online. I might do most of my studying in a library, but I'm not actually pulling physical books off the shelves. I'm reading PDFs or, or something like that. And then, you know, the teacher maybe distributes some reading uh, by email and different things get submitted through maybe an LMS and, and so on. There's still like quite a bit of activity on a physical campus, which is itself online. It's not like aggregated into a single service, but they're just all these different touch points that are managed on the internet. Um, when COVID hit, everything had to move online uh, for most universities. So the kind of 27 or maybe 34,000 universities that are in the world, um, it all just, you know, generally moved 100% online. Many universities were not prepared for that transition. So it was a little bit chaotic. You know, you might discover that you had a, a really good physical library, but not a very good digital library, or you had really good techniques as a teacher for engaging students in a classroom, but you had to discover new techniques for engaging them over Zoom or another video conferencing platform. So that was a big transition. And then as we come out of COVID, what does it look like um, for universities that have increased the percentage of their general online activities? So they've seen that there is a requirement to be more resilient in the online space um, for handling their kind of everyday functions, but also um, as we move to towards a world with more remote work, I think that the use of, of blended learning has increased a lot. So uh, like my first kind of point of call would be to say, even looking at traditional universities, what percentage of the activities is online? If it was maybe like, I don't know, gut check 30% to 50% pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. my guess would be it's over 50% post-pandemic. Um, you know, you have that physical classroom experience. But then kind of everything else happens online, uh, which, which is quite a lot. So uh, on the Wolf side, you know, we do get a, an insight into many different colleges and different countries and what they're doing. Um, and there's a lot of diversity there. But we are really focused on which parts of their activities can be captured online. And if that one experience where they're in a classroom happens on Zoom or happens in a physical meeting, we're less concerned about that. It's all the peripheral stuff that we tend to be really focused on at Wolf. Gotcha. Yeah, and it is, that is like a really good point is like, you know, 
the sort of digital augmentation of the hired experience was sort of creeping its way in slowly but surely. And then as with so many other things, and this is almost becoming sort of like, you know, uh, I don't know, like a cliche thing to say, but like, you know, the pandemic accelerated change. And, uh, you know, in this context, it was like, yeah, everything from the learning management system to, yeah, like how are classes facilitated and how are students and faculty and staff all communicating with each other. So I think you've seen uh, so many different things kind of blossom and just really like solidify their position to where, like you said, like at least like half of the experience is happening, you know, digitally and it, it, it's, you know, the entire scope of the student experience is going to have some aspect of it that is happening, you know, online. So, and yeah, I think just certain institutions or how student studies or just, you know, from kind of one, even like semester to the next or something, you know, for an individual student, like it's going to change of just sort of like, oh, I'm taking like more online classes or fewer or, um, yeah different things like that but like I've, I've, I've just loved to see you know especially like for online learner communities stuff around like doing like asynchronous like chat platforms and you know how are these students like collaborating and communicating with one another um because like you know there's so many pain points around like if you're doing like a group project or like if you're like you know confused about something it can be hard to like you know get a response from a TA or a faculty member, yeah. like when you want it or how you want it, that sort of thing. So those have been really cool aspects of sort of like, you know, the current, current landscape. One way I like to think about it is what's the fidelity of communication and then what's the fidelity of matching. And so fidelity of communication would be like, well, an old analog corded telephone voice call had a certain like staticky sound to it. And mm -hmm. maybe more recent technologies have a slightly better sound and the speed at which, you know, your voice is carried introduces a lag and all of that adds up to a kind of friction that makes it feel harder to communicate with people over distance. Um, on the other hand, when you get a point to point connection online, you can get a, a much higher fidelity match between what you're interested in and maybe the course you want to take. And so if you just go to a physical campus, you're kind of rolling the dice after that that you're going to get all the matches that you want. I really want to take a course in X or a course in Y, and you hope that they've got somebody who's teaching those courses, and you hope that you know they're good. Whereas if you do it online, you have a much broader pool to select from, and so you get a higher fidelity match, but maybe the fidelity of communication is lower, where you have these you know um, frictions around communication and so on. One of the really interesting things to me is, well, as we start optimizing more for fidelity of matches and the quality of online communication improves, when do you get a kind of tipping point where it starts to feel a lot more like natural conversation when you're having a video call? Those microsecond lags are, are no longer um, as, as much friction and you're just a lot happier that you've got a fidelity of match where you're talking to the right people. So that's like one of the spectrums that I tend to think about. It's been great to see the, the quality of tools improve over the years. And if we look at that kind of trajectory of tool improvement, I think that directionally, it seems like we're going to end up in a place where we have higher fidelity communication uh, using technology than we do today. And that will increase the, the sort of um, desire for people to get a high fidelity match. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think something else here, like, it was kind of an interesting take of like where my brain went with like the fidelity is like, again, almost like, cause I, my brain keeps going to just being really excited about more, uh, universities and programs and classes and everything like integrating Slack discord or any of the other tools or stuff like that. And like the idea of almost like the fidelity being where like, you know, <laughs> especially like it's like between students or like, cause it may be, maybe it's hard like for a student with a faculty to, you know, have there be kind of a shared understanding here, but I was almost thinking about like, yeah, like students would be able to connect with one another about their class using like gifts and memes and whatever, if they're like, you know, like, Oh my God, like, you know, this paper is so hard and whatever, like yeah. they're at least like, you know, getting some camaraderie and support from one another and being like, well, Hey, like, you know, it might be sort of like, yeah. Using gifts and stuff to like kind of get on with one another. But then like, 
they can also just be in the same sort of breath like hey well like you know here's like a study guide or something that i use that like really helped me like to kind of organize my thoughts or something whatever like but there's there's also just like the asynchronous part of it so you can kind of jump in when you're ready and able or catch up on everything that happened before and yeah if you need to kind of like reread things so it, that like kind of fidelity to it where like you know because i was thinking of yeah, like the idea of maybe like way back in the day so the advent of like oh well, like i can call my faculty member on the phone because they've got a phone number <laughs> and like i you know whatever and it's like yeah like there's a, a value in that you know where it's like okay i'm at my house and you know, maybe my faculty member is in their office on campus and it's like one to one. But like you said, it's like, oh, well, like the quality is not really great and all that. But it is it's like, I know I am talking to this person right now. Like, or yeah. I guess I have a, a certain deal of confidence. I can't see them. I don't, you know, I'm just trusting by the weird sounding variation of their voice over the phone or whatever. But like, uh, you know, so that there's value in that. But then there's all those other things where it's like, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And now, you know, here we are where it's like, okay, I have, you know, Zoom office hours. So it's like, you can jump in, I can screen share, you see me, we're doing all this stuff. And like, that just, you know, uh, really has made such, such a huge positive impact in kind of the current landscape of, you know, engaging uh, learning communities, you know, amongst each other and between like students and faculty and everything. But um, yeah, there's there's a whole generation of students um, who are coming into university after the advent of smartphones. And for many of them, it's more natural to communicate online with their peers uh, using tools like a smartphone and chat or or GIFs or other async and mixed synchronous uh, communication forms than maybe talking. Right. So the, the irony is you get everybody into the same room and they all start texting or, or surfing on their phones. Um, so like there are definitely advantages of having, um, online mediums to support even for a physical, um, meetup, but of course we're all physical people. We all, you know, want to see people, uh, in real life. And one of the interesting phenomena that we've seen is kind of cloud-based communities that end up having physical presences. So we've got a couple mm -hmm. colleges at Wolf which are, are kind of internet native and all the learning happens online, but they're starting to establish physical presences where a student can actually go stay in a residence hall. When they take their classes, they all have to get online, um, but then they can have meals together and they can socialize with each other and so on. So I think that's a really interesting direction where all the kind of learning, which is deeply cognitive is happening you know, on the internet, which, which is very information heavy. And then a lot of the socializing is broken out and separated from that and handled in residence halls and so on, which are independent of exactly who they might be connecting with. And so in that kind of scenario, what are you doing? You're optimizing for the highest fidelity connection with the best courses, and then you're optimizing for the highest fidelity communication with your peers. Yeah, I do. I do like that idea because i do think you're getting a bit of the the best of both worlds there um for sure with that kind of model um but i, I think something that's on my mind here so i'm going to kind of lead the question a little bit um yeah so you know thinking about like the struggles you know doing all this kind of work something that came to mind and i'm just curious your sort of point of view because i think this applies to faculty staff and students is sort of like as much as like you know we think of people as you know especially uh students nowadays as like digital natives or just like everything's so ubiquitous. So I'm like, sure, everybody knows exactly how to use things and all that. But like for everybody in this experience, I think there's, you know, that assumption that everybody has digital literacy, but it's something that I think we can certainly do a lot better in, uh, you know, guiding people towards. It's just how to effectively know, like, you know, which platform a tool is going to be the best to communicate or do things depending on what you need and different things like that. But yeah, I'm just thinking about the struggles here to sort of acknowledge sort of the, you know, the friction points as much as this has been something that's sort of been kind of seeping its way into the university experience and accelerated so much over the past two years. But where do you see those struggles? And I think my mind is going towards one of them being like digital literacy for faculty, staff and students. But, um, you know, if you want to tackle that one or anything yeah. else, I'm just curious what's on your mind there for sort of the, the, the struggles. Yeah, I, I think... You know, because there tends to be an age gap, we've usually seen the bigger struggle on the faculty side. 
um, when the pandemic first hit, we were supporting one organization where a number of the faculty didn't actually have their own home computers and mm -hmm. they would hold classes by teleconference call uh, with like an analog telephone. And so it was a big leap to get them totally integrated and, and home set up and, you know, onto a learning platform and, you know, using that every day. Whereas their students in some cases were in uh, Shanghai and China and were digital natives and were just going so much faster than them in terms of their ability to, to process a new tool and to use different kinds of technology. Um, so we have seen, you know, the staff struggle more than the students. That, that's sort of like the general picture. But you can't just assume that because people are coming from a lot of different backgrounds. And so it is important um, in the same way that you would check literacy going into an institution to have a kind of leveling up program. You know, many, many institutions have like a writing center. If people haven't got the kind of um, high school or school level education in a certain area, you probably need some equivalent to that in technology just to make sure that everybody who comes in knows how to use all the tools. And you get students from a, a different background and maybe they haven't had as much exposure. And so you do need to be able to support for that. Um, but the sort of broad assumption, you know, cutting across a huge range of backgrounds uh, that we've seen, uh, you know, proven over and over is that the students are, are really competent uh, with online tools. They're not fussed by big changes in technology. They've got, you know, 30 tabs open and they're switching between platforms um, really fluidly and they don't seem to experience a lot of friction of, um, in those changes. Whereas we tended to anticipate on our side that it was going to be really hard to move between platforms. So we had to like really reduce the friction there, and, you know, design the experience in a really uh, optimal way. And in general, we've seen that that's just less true than we anticipated, that students are, are pretty comfortable jumping between um, different kinds of web applications. Yeah. And I think, it, yeah, it's the idea where like they would need the least support for sure like i think you know you can do sort of an online orientation just at least like acknowledge like okay so here are the tools you're going to be using and like you know if you need more support like here's something like user guides or whatever and then like yeah like definitely focus more of the energy and support for faculty and staff because i think like you know i've seen and um even then kind of like heading towards my next question but like some of the strategies here is like yeah like you may make sure that you have dedicated support staff that can maybe even like sit in live sessions when like an instructor is teaching online so they can just focus on teaching and if they're like hey support person like i'm having a little bit of issue doing x y or z and the support person just sort of like you know jumps up and is able to like you know do stuff on the back end on a technical level yeah. while the faculty focuses on teaching and those sort of things but um yeah just like knowing that i think it's time well spent and you know, it's good to invest resources and in being like, okay, like we're going to like over the summer or whenever, like make sure we have like workshops and all that for folks to jump in. If like, Hey, if you really feel like you want to have more of a deep dive on how to better use the learning management system, you know, or anything like that, like, you know, we'll walk you through it. Cause again, yeah, like anybody, faculty, staff, or students, there's going to be the people who are just a little bit, you know, more inclined towards kind of uh, climbing up the learning curve uh, than others. So it's like, well, let's just make space and, you know, it can't, it can even be, you know, okay, if we've got these champions who are like rock stars at using this particular tool, let's tap them on the shoulder and be like, hey, would you like to teach your colleagues about how to, you know, better use this platform and stuff just so that, you know, everyone's more comfortable. But I just, yeah, I mean, there's, there's that piece of it, like digital literacy, um, you know, just comfortable with tools and everything. And certainly like uh, for students, I think like another aspect of it is sometimes how you speak online because like the idea of like you know so much of it happening just sort of like over chat and text and stuff like that where it's just like just be a little bit mindful of like how you say something because you know somebody's reading that with whatever sort of mindset yeah. they're coming at it with so just like you know simple things like that and it's just like you know just not taking it for granted and knowing where to sort of put the right kind and the right amount of emphasis to help people be more digitally literate is definitely yeah i think uh, good good to try to overcome some of those struggles but um it seems like one of one of the issues is what is the institutional appetite for investing in online infrastructure so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you had a huge investment into libraries and you had huge amount of you know training and thoughtful practices that were built around libraries you know to get faculty trained to have incoming students, you know, walking on tours to the library, um, 
at a certain point in time to introduce the card catalog system and how to find a book uh, and things like that. And most of that stuff is really being replaced by newer online tools. And there hasn't always been the same level of investment and thoughtfulness around how to make uh, these tools have the same level of importance as those older physical tools. And they do have the same level of importance. At least in my experience, anecdotally, I would say if I assign students in my um, teaching at Oxford, uh, some set of books in the library, and then I also attached PDFs of a set of articles, they always just read the PDFs. And if I provided, you know, an online link to like the online version of a book, those ones would show up in the footnotes and the ones that didn't have an online version didn't get read. And, you know, really we've got to take seriously the fact that people are going to use the online resources and we need to have investment and training around those, which is commensurate with their practical importance. So like on the infrastructure side, I'd say, you know, we've got a long history in universities of investing a lot and we've got to treat the kind of digital infrastructure in a similar way. On the kind of online communication side, yeah, there are probably techniques that need to be honed for how to understand the different registers of communication that happen online. What's an informal chat with your friends versus what's a chat with your professor? How might those look different from each other? Um, and how do you communicate professionally online while ensuring that other people don't misunderstand you and that it's still a kind of courteous and uh, supportive environment? Yeah. Um, the last point here um, that I'm, I'm kind of thinking about as struggles too is what you're kind of acknowledging is like the access that students have and like it's just something to be mindful of because I think it's still kind of funny to me that like I think sometimes the the point of view of being like really mobile optimized and mobile friendly because like it just made me think when thinking about students across the world and everything like there's just sometimes like culturally where like they just depending on on how old you are or where you come from where there's just like they just lean so heavily on using their phone for everything or other kind of devices and, and then when they're coming to college like that's how they're planning to you know engage in their studies it's like yeah i mean like i'll do a lot of it on my phone right and it's like well uh maybe hopefully like you know in terms of like how the institution set up to you know have students like access the you know various like tools and platforms and stuff like that so um yeah and the, because what sort of made, got me thinking about that was just when you mentioned like yeah like well the, even certain faculty like don't have like stuff set up you know uh either at home or i'm sure maybe even like in their offices to like you know be really conducive to you know teaching well online or you know engaging with their communities and everything so I think that's just another sort of like you know little thing to put in people's ears you know just to be thinking about just like hmm, yeah like how are we you know sort of innovating our experience to sort of like you know just be better conducive to success in the space for you know global online learners which i think you know every institution now recognizes is going to be you know just here to stay and part of their strategy moving forward and everything. But I think it takes a lot of like sort of these, just the overriding philosophy, but then it can just kind of boil down to sort of the really micro sort of choices you make about how you sort of, you know, train and support people and, you know, just the way that you uh, set up access points for, you know, how students and everything kind of navigate the institution online. Yeah. I, once you, once you concede, uh, that a student is going to gather most of the information for anything they're learning uh, online, then you have to begin to develop strategies for training people to sift information and evaluate what good sources of information are on the internet. Um, and that isn't as well defined, I would say, compared to older methods that use physical books where you could determine whether the book was peer reviewed, whether it was published by university press, whether it was citing uh, original sources and, and so on. And that just looked a lot more obvious and the techniques for determining the value of the information were a lot clearer when you only dealt with physical resources. You know, one of the things we've had to do at Wolf is create a kind of resource classification system for evaluating the overall compliance with accreditation of any given program and really be able to say at a granular level, you know, are students reading, you know, junk or are they reading stuff that, that is substantive? And how do you go about defining 
what counts as graduate level reading versus undergraduate level reading? Um, what are the quality of resources involved in a program? So I think that's new terrain. Um, we're probably breaking some new ground at Wolf in the way that we've developed something called an accreditation quality score and tried to use that internally to assess whether or not programs are, are meeting all the standards. Um, that it would have been probably easier to assess if it were a purely physical information-based environment. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that'll be one of my um, kind of final questions as we're winding down here is just sort of uh, if you want to sort of highlight strategies that you've seen be successful here and sort of all the things that we've talked about it, I think you've kind of noted a few sort of ideas or philosophies as well, but just anything as, as, as granular or sort of specific as you might want to get. And I think, if you want to just lead towards what I wanted to ask after this about like resources, you could kind of just, you know, uh, combine these next few questions about sort of like sharing resources that could help people have strategies to be successful here and engaging these, you know, global online learner communities and everything. But, you know, try to get down to stuff that uh, folks can take away as some uh, some homework, some stuff to uh, take a look at. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I My guess would be that there are some... Um, points of commonality between the way Wolf's colleges teach their students. And, and so we see that engaging in a community of peers is really important. We see that feedback provided by teachers to students on a regular basis tends to improve student outcomes. And some of those points are, are really common. Um, and there have been a lot of studies around students being more successful when they have uh, peer support and when they get you know, some grades, even if they're not final grades from a teacher on a regular basis. Uh, but Wolf has colleges in at least seven countries. And so there's also a lot of diversity in, in what looks like a good online learner experience in India might not be the same as in Nigeria or in Latin America. And so it's exciting to see the ways different communities have evolved uh, their own methods of engaging their learners to produce successful outcomes. There's not like a one size all solution that we've seen. Um, and, and it varies both in terms of like national uh, or local culture, as well as the program involved. So you know, the way the computer science students are, are getting together is really different than the way the philosophy students are getting together uh, to support each other and to lead to good outcomes. So that, that's been um, exciting to see. Um, we're, we're kind of generally pedagogically agnostic as to what the right solution is, provided it's leading to the, the outcomes that we think are really important in terms of student success. Yeah, you know, and it makes me think too, because I think that's an important recognition is that there's not kind of the, you know, like you said, one size fits all. Um, like, well, if you just do this, then it's all going to work out perfectly. But um, as I was listening to a Freakonomics podcast episode, I was acknowledging sort of cultural differences and that um, I, you know, they said it explicitly in the episode. And I, I just, you know, it makes sense that they said it. I just wouldn't have thought it, you know, without the sort of the prompting. But uh, that it seems to be a American thing to want just sort of the like black and white. So it's like, all right, just tell me what to do. Like, how do I do it? Like, what's the, you know, what's the strategy? How do I, you know, whatever. And it's mm -hmm. just like, everything's a little bit more complicated and complex than that, you know? Like, so it, it just takes just that little bit more uh, kind of thoughtful approach to kind of, you know, examine things and sort of take what you, what feels as though it's going to be that sort of better fit and more sort of uniquely contoured to, yeah, like your institution, how you, uh, you know, instruct your students and just sort of, yeah, your kind of cultural uh, sort of climate and everything. But um, yeah, I mean, that that's almost just like the, 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 the big strategy or sort of the advice is to just kind of uh, not just think like, okay, if I just like do this, then, you know, yeah. everything's going to work out perfectly. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, I would say that we were more opinionated pedagogically as an organization when we started and we tended to promote certain learning styles and we increasingly discovered that there were other just as successful learning styles and that what really mattered was are students achieving the learning outcomes that have been set out in this program are they able to you know perform the tasks or understand things do they have competence in the area and there might be a lot of different routes to getting there so I, i've gotten less opinionated about what counts as good pedagogy and gotten more focused on, on the kind of learning outcomes over time and whether or not students are really competent at the end that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think, yeah, like you, you know, you and your team always being the resource to share. I'm sure, like you said, like you just have, you know, so much that you can sort of 
pull from or hopefully just like get folks thinking with if uh you know they, they connect with you all but yeah we'll we'll end on our usual ender ending question here um if you just want to share a final thought or call to action on this topic uh to end the episode but uh yes the the floor is yours well, um, you can certainly learn more about Wolf at wolf.university. It's W-O-O-L-F. And our mission is to increase access to world-class higher education. And if you're looking for a book that's more tactical around you know, the principles of online learning, I recommend Stephen Coslin's Active Learning Online, Five Principles That Make um, Online Learning um, Successful. And, and you know that's a, a sort of great resource if you're really interested in, you know, how many minutes should pass before you have a, a trigger for a student to, to learn something and, and remember something and things like that. Perfect. Well, that's a beautiful thing to have kind of a call to action towards a, a great resource like that. And to, yeah, just to connect with you all to keep the conversation going. So we have, have all the, the ways to do that and the things that we've talked about in the show notes uh, as usual, but uh Thank you so much, Joshua, for for hanging out and sharing all that you did, and for the for the great work that you and your team are doing there at Wolf. And like I said, I've just been really fascinated by it, so I'm just uh, very grateful for the opportunity to kind of just hear more from you and kind of what you're thinking about, and uh, yeah, just sharing this all out to, uh, with our community here. So um, yeah, just thank you for the time. Well, thanks, Dustin, for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.